Civic Ventures. Um, I think he's starting to turn the page for the next chapter, so I would not be surprised if that happens. And he already has Jeff Wilkie uh, leading the consumer business and Andy Jassy re leading AWS. So I think this could very well happen. Um, so the prediction on HQ2, that's probably coming up here in the next, after the midterm elections is what we're predicting, is yes. when that announcement will come. P are my friends at Pittsburgh, we love Pittsburgh. We wanted to go to Pittsburgh. We want to move back to Pittsburgh and hang out there some more. I hate to tell you, I don't think it's going to Pittsburgh. It's in my top five or six, but I don't think it's going there. The bones of that city are great, and there's a lot of room for it to go there, but I don't think it's Pittsburgh. I've wavered, actually, on this, and I've wavered between two cities. Between my initial pick was Toronto, and then I started shifting to D.C. because I thought DC, there are three cities in the D.C. area where I thought I was going to go. But does Amazon really want to be part of that morass? I don't know. I'm shifting back to Toronto. You are? Yep. I'm All right. shifting back to Toronto. Yeah, I, oh, there we go. We got some All Canadians. right, so our, some of our Canadian friends are here too, yes. <laughs> yeah, it, t Toronto, Austin. Uh, yeah, Austin's North, a possibility too. You know where it's really going though? It's going to Northern Virginia. Well, this is the column I've not yet uh, written for GeekWire, uh, which I've wanted to. So maybe after the summit dies down, I can actually write this column. But I think uh, HQ2 has already been chosen. Guess where it is? Seattle. You've got to explain yourself on that. Seattle is going to be HQ2. The, the, the momentum of Amazon is going to shift to this new city, and Seattle will be the HQ2. Oh. HQ1 will be the new city. Ooh. And my prediction with Jeff Bezos, with his chairman role, is he's going to relocate and spend the bulk of his time in that city. Oh, so we're second. We're second. We're second. We're second. Yep. Okay, gotcha. Sorry right. to inform you. <laughs> Sell your houses now. <laughs> AI automation and jobs, implications on these topics will become much more clear over 2021. Virtual and augmented reality as well. When will it become mainstream? What form will it take? You know, I've, I've become a huge fan of the Oculus Go. I've been surprised that it has not yet brought virtual reality into the mainstream, the ability to use virtual reality without wires. To me, that will come by 2021. And we have a great example of this, uh, the Boeing booth. Make sure to check that out today. They've got the International Space Station Boeing docking system where you can do virtual reality. So a plug for that to go check that out if you've not experienced uh, a virtual reality system before. Very cool. All right, so that is a quick look back and a look ahead at what to expect over the next two days and the next three years. Before we jump in, remember, tweet early and often. The hashtag is GWSummit. And with that, we are going to jump into our first session. And I'd like to give a big shout out to our sponsor of the first session, the International Coach Federation, to sign up for your own coaching session right here at the conference. You can go see them outside. Let's catch a quick video of the International Coach Federation. Coaching essentially is a, a process that will help you to get to where you want to be in a much shorter time and to achieve the success that you want to achieve in life without doing it on your own. Coaching is a guided process where somebody helps you through the power of questions and active listening come to your own conclusion. You have to get your own answers. And these are the best answers because you are the, the expert for yourself. So I think coaching is the, the leadership style of the future. A big thanks to the International Coach Federation for sponsoring this session of the summit. You can check them out in the lobby or schedule a coaching session via the app. All right, let's jump in. Our first speaker's mom was a teacher, giving her a fierce love of reading, and her dad was a pharmacist, giving her an early appreciation for the privilege of working in the field of health. She went on to become a doctor, a scientist, an oncologist, biotech leader, university chancellor, and now for more than four years, the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, giving her a rare blend of experience in health, education, science, research, and product development. She joins us to share insights into the quest to end disease, 
transform education, and lift people out of poverty around the world. Please welcome our first speaker of the 2018 GeekWire Summit, Gates Foundation CEO, Sue Desmond Hellman. Thank you, Sue. Good morning. Good morning, Sue. It's great to have you here. Thank you for being here. I'm really glad to be here. Good morning, everyone. Did the party last late last night? It, it was pretty late. Party. Are you awake? <laughs> <laughs> so, Sue, let's start with a big picture question. I think a lot of people are familiar with the Gates Foundation's pillars in global health and U.S. education, and clearly you've had an increasing focus on U.S. poverty initiatives as an underlying driver of some of the issues that you're trying to tackle. You've been the CEO of the Gates Foundation now for more than four years. Mm -hmm. Give us your report card. Catch us up. Where are you seeing success? Where are you seeing things that are more of a struggle than you wanted them to be? And, and what's next? Well, um, first of all, let me tell you what hasn't changed. Um, I came to Gates Foundation because I love the mission and I love the work. And this North Star that we have, all lives have equal value, remains our North Star. That is, we're dogged about that. Um, what what I think has evolved for us over these last four and a half years is a couple of things that I think may resonate for your audience. I, I love that the, the Coaching Federation is sponsoring this. We have gone deep on culture. We realize like anybody who's running an institution that the, if our staff comes to work every day excited, um, ready to go, collaborative, easy to work with, um, that works well. So we've worked really hard on culture, and part of that is having the humility to listen and learn from others. So our evolution in global development and global health has, we still focus on the big diseases. We want to end polio, and we've made significant progress on that. We want to make sure that people don't, people who live in places that have low resources um, don't have vaccine preventable diseases. So things that you can prevent with a vaccine like measles just shouldn't happen um, in rich world or, or the low resource world. So those things have not changed, but increasingly countries are driving their own health transformation. So that humility, that culture of listening and learning and partnering is way more important for us than ever before. So government of India, government of Ethiopia, and more are saying to Gates Foundation, look, here's what we want to have happen in our country. Can you help us with that journey? That's a transformation from us saying we have something for you. People are lifting themselves out of poverty. And I think that's a wonderful trend and really has transformed how we think about our global work in a positive way. Here in the US, we recognize something after nearly two decades in education and that is that many things that cause inequity in the United States happen outside the classroom. That's a big aha for us, that we have not stopped um, focusing on education as the escalator out of uh, poverty or low resource situations. What's new for us is uh, the recognition and the investment, $158 million over the next four years, on economic mobility and opportunity. We need to change things not only in the classroom, but outside the classroom. Now, I know you actually have news to break on that very topic yeah. because you have started to spend some of that commitment. And in fact, you're making the first grant out of that That's commitment right. and you're announcing it today. We're announcing it today. The, the first grant out of that four-year commitment is a $15 million grant uh, to Raj Chetty and his colleagues for the Opportunity Institute. And the Opportunity Institute gives us a chance to, to really allow people who are in the trenches in every community, including this community, to understand the, at a census level where there are areas where the American dream can come true and where it's less likely that the American dream can come true. So these kinds of maps, and we see one here on the screen of, of Seattle, really teach not only people from an academic standpoint or economists, but more importantly, teach decision makers and people making decisions for themselves, neighborhoods where there's more opportunity for their children. This is a fascinating map, and this was actually published in the New York Times yesterday as yes. an example of this. 
what does this map tell you? Because before you were able to look at it on a much broader level, but this is actually down to the census tract in terms of economic mobility of kids born right. into poverty. Exactly. What can you see with this precise level of data? So with this precise level of data, you can literally see where it is more or less likely that a child can attain an income higher than their parent. That, that's the American dream, right? That the, our children can do better than we can. And so if you are the housing department in King County and you're, you have Section 8 vouchers, you can let folks know that those Section 8 vouchers, they can go to a high opportunity neighborhood. So you can have an impact and actionable data at this kind of level, neighborhood, neighborhood by neighborhood, where the opportunity lies in Seattle. So where does this go next? Because I know this is a national database that's been created by Ross Shetty and right. his colleagues. Where do you take this next? And what, do you, what will your grant do? Well, there's a couple things that we think are most important. One is, like all data, and I know there's a lot of data geeks in this audience, like all data, it doesn't matter if it doesn't get to where it needs to get. So we want the data to be in the most user-friendly formats. You can actually go in the New York Times article and find your neighborhood, your hometown, where you go to school or where your kids go to school. And so we want the data to be actionable and available. Very, very important. But secondly, when you see these data, the first question that pops to mind is, why is it different? by neighborhood. What, it, it, for me, when I first saw Raj Chetty's data and the differences by census tract, it told me something positive, which is if there's some differences, we can understand the root causes of a lack of opportunity. What, what bad things happen in neighborhoods of low opportunity, and even more importantly, what are the positives? What are the attributes of those census tracts where there's more opportunity? So we need to dig deeper and understand the why. That's great. So we actually have a poll, a quiz here for the audience. You can go into the GeekWire Summit app and answer this. I will we'll come back to this in a moment. This is actually from one of your favorite books, Factfulness, right. by Hans Rosling. And the question is, in the last 20 years, the proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty has A, almost doubled, B, remained more or less the same, or C, been cut almost in half. So don't give the answer. I know you know the answer. We'll, we'll return to this in a <laughs> no second. Cheating. I'd be really curious. It'd be a really fascinating experiment here to see if the crowd here in the summit knows this answer better than the average population. I think they might. They think they might. So we'll come back to that in, in just a second. Um, so big picture, when you look at the tech industry and people here in tech companies, startups, they are really thinking a lot about health generally, whether that's global health, personal health. What would be the areas that you would point them to for the biggest opportunity to make an impact either in business or on the world? Yeah. Well, a, a couple things, and it feels like such a gift to get to talk to th this audience and people who are driving innovation. The, the first thing I would say is the, um, you don't have to be a billionaire and you don't have to be not-for-profit to make a big difference and make a big impact. And I think it's a misconception that all good things that happen to people happen in not-for-profit or in foundations or, uh, or because of billionaires. What I'm most excited about is people who tap into the same passion and pace and talent that we see in business for good. Mm. And so I would want people in this room to know a couple things. First of all, areas, some of which you heard on the predictions. I'm really excited about artificial intelligence for clinical trials, really, really excited. I'm incredibly excited about using smart enough phones and geospatial mapping to do things like we see in Africa for soil mapping. If you could do soil mapping and you're a smallholder farmer and you can see areas just like we talked about opportunity zones, there's opportunities that we see also for better soil 
and less good soil for farmers. And so the using crowdsourcing and using geospatial mapping, we can literally know, let both farmers and the farmers helpers, teachers in these areas where smallholder farmers work, where the best soil is. So geospatial mapping and crowdsourcing are big in terms of, of things like agriculture and agricultural productivity, which are big for us. The other area that's just um, on fire, I mean, we saw now you can do an EKG on your Apple Watch. Um, here's the other thing that we've seen. Increasingly, it's so important for human capital development that not only your body, your height, your weight, but your brain develop when you're young. So there's a magic period of time for all of us, no matter where we live, the first thousand days from conception to the age of two. It turns out that if you don't develop during that thousand days, you won't be as smart as you could be. You won't live up to your full potential. So using technology to measure height and weight, um, uh, there's a, an app called Auto Anthro. And we're looking at uh, it right here, actually. Auto Anthro allows you to do something that's actually really challenging to do with a small child, height and weight, arm circumference. So there's two ways we use this. One is it's an emergency. If your arm circumference becomes really small, it's an emergency. You can die. A child can die of a se severe acute malnutrition. That is something that should never happen. But it's just as important over time that if you're chronically stunted and wasted, if you're small and short, that says something about your opportunities in life. And so we're very much focused on understanding that making sure moms are well nourished when she gets pregnant and has her children and can space her children and making sure kids get the nutrition they need to have a healthy, productive life. And this is the app you're referring to. It's called Auto Anthro, and it basically is able to measure the circumference of the arm to detect all sorts of other things about your development. Exactly, using a small pad, and, and you can on this, this small tablet keep track of many, many children, measure their arm circumference, and look at these data that suggest the future of that child uh, that a frontline healthcare worker can use anywhere. So these are a couple examples of innovations, things that tech companies or other innovators are doing right to get into global health. What are the biggest mistakes that you see tech companies, yeah. tech engineers make when they enter either global health or health and try and solve a problem that others in perhaps the health industry yeah. itself might not have been able to tackle? Well, it, it, there's mistakes that I think happen in any inno innovation, which is the absence of a user-centric design, forgetting who's going to use that. Um, and in the cases where we work, especially in health, remembering the educational level of the individual who you expect to use this new technique or this new approach, remembering the low resource areas, there may not be reliable electricity. There may not be a reliable internet. And so overestimating the capabilities of the user, overestimating the environmental conditions is a frequent problem that we see with technology. But I would say that, that the other problem is um, a, an absence of listening skills or understanding skills. We've tried to, to make sure that we get really close to where the problem is so that we don't forget that we need to deeply understand the problem we're trying to solve. And so, you know, the old thing of if, if you have a hammer, everything is a, you see is a nail, we really need to understand the problems because the solutions need to fit the issue that people are dealing with every day. So when you look at that, are there particular things, particular applications that have the biggest opportunity out there uh, in the developing world in particular that, that if, if you were running a tech company, you would go after? Yeah, well, it, the, the delivery of frontline health for people is massively important. And so because human resources are limited, you, you have a very limited number of physicians, trained nurses, so you have community health workers. That community health worker might be on a motorbike, a bicycle, or walking large, long distances. So both making her, usually it's a she, allowing her to be as efficient as possible and allowing her to have data and then utilize data to drive her decision making and the people she serves, really simple tools that allow her to both diagnose 
illness when it occurs and deliver care as simply as possible, any tool that allows for that is massively important. I don't know if you've noticed, but the Gates Foundation is just a few blocks away from an, another large enterprise here in Seattle, <laughs> Amazon, whose founder just recently announced that he is making a big move into philanthropy himself. Yes. Has Jeff Bezos popped by your office to ask you for advice on the, the new fund that he launched? He is welcome anytime, anytime. <laughs> I'm really excited that he's getting more into philanthropy. What would be your advice to him? You've been doing this now for more than four years yeah. uh, as the head of the world's largest philanthropy. What would be your advice to him as he embarks on this new initiative? Well, well first of all, I, I, would, I would tell him two things I actually learned at University of California, San Francisco. So I was a fundraiser. I was on the other side. And I learned so much about philanthropy as chancellor because, you know, I'm raising money for a public university. And I became chancellor in 2009. So if people remember California, public university, big recession, yeah. not the easiest time to ask for money. So the, the two things I learned that I thought were just profoundly important, one is just like everything else. I mean, I, I don't know what sport you like, but I find practice helps a lot. Practicing is actually great with generosity. And so I tell people there's no bad generosity. It might be your church. It might be the local soup kitchen. It might be actually somebody who you say a kind word to because you're being generous and kind and you sense that they could use a kind word. Practicing is amazing with generosity. If you give and you understand the results of that giving and look deeply at outcomes and you're intellectually honest, as I know Jeff is, there's a feedback loop. So uh, practicing and allowing for a feedback loop is essential part of philanthropy. I think it's underestimated. The second thing I would say is the, it, it, there isn't one great way to give away money. There isn't one way. So I don't think the Gates Foundation has the corner on all great things. I'm really excited about where we give and what Bill and Melinda have decided to focus on. So I'm all in. I think there are great causes and there are other great causes. And so what I would love to see any philanthropist do is practice and figure out where big needs are, where you feel like you can make a unique contribution. Yeah. And it's all good. It's, it's interesting because Jeff Bezos is part of a trend, really, and, and you can also look at other initiatives like the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And I know Priscilla Chan, she, you, she's a pediatrician, so you both come from areas of health, and I know that she's visited the Gates Foundation. I was her chancellor. She was a medical student at UCSF. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Do you feel an affinity for her? I know that you talk about things. Do you feel an affinity for her and her background and where she's headed in philanthropy? Uh, absolutely, and, and the, the really wonderful uh, um, thing I can tell you is a week ago, I hosted Priscilla at, at right up here in Seattle. Uh, at the Gates Foundation for what, what we call a staff chat. So everybody could ask her questions. So she comes from a place like I do of wanting the world to be more fair, particularly as a pediatrician for children, that, that it, every child have an equal chance at life. And she shows up that way, but she's also super smart and really interested in driving change and improvements in the areas of health and disease and education. What kinds of things do you talk about with her? What, what advice and challenges do you address? So we talk about things that you would expect that we talk about. We talk about lessons. We talk about things like how you get the best talent, how you recruit great talent in the not-for-profit sector. You know, we're competing yeah. with probably some of you and others who have uh, stock options and who are in the for-profit sector. So how you attract and retain great talent is a big topic for Priscilla and I. It's interesting. I went to uh, lunch at the Gates Foundation a couple months ago, and walking through that cafeteria, I got to tell you, as somebody who visits a lot of tech companies, I mean, it was like the United Nations in <laughs> yes. there. And I recognize that clearly you have the ability, given the foundation's status, to attract and retain that broad diversity. But the other thing that struck me was, even though that is kind of the nirvana for what the tech industry is going for in terms of that level of diversity, that is a wide variety of cultures, a wide variety of backgrounds, many different perspectives. What are the challenges of managing that kind of global workforce, right. literally? Yeah. So we have, we have staff, as we should, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from India, Southeast Asia, China, Europe, 
we, we truly are global. And we also have people who come from the UN agency background, academic backgrounds, for profit and not for profit. So it's a true melting pot. I'd actually like us to be more diverse, um, particularly for our US staff. Mm. We're constantly looking at more leaders who are female, more people of color, like all, uh, um, like all areas of institutions in the US. There's, a, there's almost like a glass ceiling for women at the Gates Foundation. That, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm an exception. Melinda's the co-chair. We just hired a new CFO and she started uh, yesterday. So we're making some progress, but we haven't gone as fast or as far as I would like. But I think to your point, one of the things about managing in the global community today is everything from cultural norms um, to religion to how you think about how you debate. I mean, we, I'm from the, the Silicon Valley area. I love a good debate. I really love getting fired up and, and hashing it out, and I feel like good things happen as a result of that. Not all cultures are comfortable with that, especially debating with the CEO. And so I've had to make sure that I understand differences in cultural norms and so we actually, one of the, the big things for us is having some shared behaviors we commit to. Um, two that I would mention are respect and trust. Mm. That, so if I wanna debate with you, if we respect each other and trust each other, that's possible no matter what our cultural norms are. In an absence of respect and trust, it's not possible. That's fascinating. So I understand that when you were interviewing for the job, you, <laughs> purposefully tried to make Bill Gates mad. Yes. <laughs> Tell us that story because that sounds like a, that sounds like a disaster in the making and you got the job. What what happened there? Well, I, I had um, heard a lot of stories about Bill. Uh, I had met him before, but only briefly and really didn't know Bill at all or Melinda for that matter. So when I interviewed for the job, um, I I was it seemed really important to me that uh, Melinda and I and that Bill and I could have the kind of um, uh, experience that I had had with Art Levinson, my boss at Genentech. And yeah. Art is fierce. Art is really fierce. And we had had so many debates and fights and uh, discussions. And I thought, I've got to be able to have that same kind of debate with Bill, despite his reputation as being so fierce. And so I said to him that, that I wanted to ask him a question about polio and that I had read a couple of things that criticized the Gates Foundation for their investment in polio because we were at the end game and there was an opportunity cost of focusing on polio when you could spend the money on other things. And what did he think about that criticism? And um, boy, he did get really fired up. <laughs> he was, uh, he strongly, uh, I think inappropriately, I, I happen to agree with him, defended that when you're at the end game of diseases, just like in smallpox, the last handfuls of cases are the most expensive for, for obvious reasons. And what I realized was two things. One is I enjoyed him getting fired up because he was, he was mad at the problem of polio. He wanted to get rid of polio, but I didn't really test what it was like for him to be mad at me, <laughs> which uh, that fierceness directed against polio all day. Like I could do that all day. When I'm on the other end, uh, that's, uh, I have since then experienced that. Yes. Um, I want to experience it as infrequently as possible. <laughs> but always, 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 and this is the special thing about Bill, he is, when he's really fired up, it's in service of, are we going fast enough? Are we as effective enough? Do we have all the right people? I'll tell you a frequent source of him saying, you didn't, you didn't tell me I needed to work harder on X. So when he thinks we haven't lived up to what, what we should be as a foundation, he's in on that too. And so the, the, the most important thing that I coach people because I tell people, look, when you're having a meeting, a, a, a really important meeting about things we care a lot about, maternal and neonatal and child health, family planning, polio, our big issues, education, economic mobility. If Bill's getting fierce, understand the source of why he's being fierce. 99% of my experience is, like 1% of us have a bad day. <laughs> you yeah. know, he's allowed, we all have a bad day. 99% is energy like, 
our children getting the vaccines that they deserve? That's a low cost vaccine. If it doesn't get there, if it's not kept in the cold chain, what more can we do to solve the problem? I can't imagine two more type A personalities to work for than Bill and Melinda. How do you, <laughs> how do you navigate that? Um, I really enjoy working uh, for and with Bill and Melinda. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm an expert on navigating that. Um, I, I actually, this is, uh, this is something I brought with me from the experience I had at Genentech and UC San Francisco. I think as, as somebody who cares a lot about um, managing, I, I've been known to say everyone deserves a great manager. Um, but now I not only say everyone deserves a great manager, but make sure you're manageable. Uh, and one way when you have fierce bosses, when you have type A personalities, which I have had pretty much my entire life, um, it's, it's really helpful to think, how do I make my boss look like a genius? Now, if your boss is Bill Gates, you know, it's a little easier. Um, but the, how do I make them look like they were really smart to hire me? So it starts with, what are the goals? Do I really understand, it being managed, what they need and expect from me? Do I have their honest feedback on how I'm performing? And I use that with everyone I manage, too. Are we completely aligned in what we need to get done? We have, we have two big ways that I'm thinking about our organization that I actually think map to any organization. One is great place to work. Uh, can I do my best work? Do I thrive? at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. If that's true, no matter what sector I came from, what country I came from, what language is my first language, if I thrive, it's gonna be easier to work with me, it's gonna be easier to collaborate with me, and I'm gonna get things done. And then great decisions. Do I know how you make decisions? Do I know what information is needed to make that decision? Do I get that information used for decision making back in the hands of decision makers in the field? So great place to work and great decisions for me are two tenants that, that really govern a lot of how I'm driving things at the foundation. You have another role that doesn't get a lot of attention in your day job because it's not your day job. You are on the Facebook board of directors. Yes. And I know that you're a stickler for corporate governance, so I'm probably not going to get you to say anything nitty gritty about the, the company's operations, but at, at a high level, there is a fundamental question right now about social networks, and I would love to get your yeah. take on it and it's come out over the past year. Do you view social networks such as Facebook, Twitter, others as media companies with a responsibility for what they publish or as technology platforms that can take the content at an arm's length and distance themselves from it in terms of liability? Yeah, so it, it, I, would, I would refer you back to what Mark said when he testified in, uh, in front of Congress. I think you can have academic debates. You can have lots of debates about media, platform. What is inarguable is it's in everyone's interest and it's important for Facebook. And this is Mark's focus. 2018 is all about making sure that Facebook is safe, making sure that users feel good about using Facebook, that the community who experience Facebook have a good experience. I don't think that whether, whether, whether the world thinks about Facebook as media or a platform, and it's different depending on who you are, how you use Facebook, the most important thing is that Facebook be a force for good. I joined the board in 2013 as a physician because I'm really intrigued about connections and about the social network. I actually started talking to Mark because I was intrigued if your neighbors have unhealthy behaviors, you tend to have unhealthy behaviors. If your social circle smokes, drinks, uh, uh, carouses, if your social cir circle acts in a certain way, you act in a certain way. So as a physician and as a scientist, understanding those connections, tapping into those connections potentially, and you, we saw on some of your future predictions, can I drive health and wellness and mental health and well-being through that network and that social connection. I think that remains an essential question for people who care about health and well-being. I think we've added another question in this last year and a half, which is, can you have all those forces for good and manage when the bad guys use those same connections for bad? Yeah, because you, you raised a good question. Is Facebook a force for good? What is your assessment of that? I, 
I have seen so many examples of Facebook being a force for good. Um, I'll give you an example that's one of my favorites. Um, there's a, a blood cancer that um, people have called multiple myeloma. And there's a few drugs that are pretty good for multiple myeloma, but about 15, 1-5% of patients with multiple myeloma didn't have a remedy. And they have a genetic um, change that makes for a worse form of myeloma and nothing for it. So a group got together on Facebook, went to Genentech and said, you know, we're all connected. If you make a new drug for this 15%, you can do a clinical trial in weeks because we're ready for you. So that power of the connection, no matter where in the world this rare genetic uh, abnormality in some patients with this blood cancer existed, gave them the power to say, look, this is gonna be really inexpensive for you to do this clinical trial because we're already here. You don't have to recruit us and we'll sign up. So you can actually cost effectively make a drug even for a small market. So I want that power of connection and networking, that force for good to be possible and eyes wide open on the downsides. That is a great segue into a topic that I really want to get your thoughts on. It's been 20 years since the release of Herceptin, Herceptin. and this was a targeted, gene-targeted therapy for cancer that you and your team developed at yeah. Genentech. This was one of the earliest examples of precision medicine, this whole idea of understanding the individual patient and their characteristics and targeting a therapy to right. them. But it's been 20 years. Would you have expected precision medicine to be further along? Because we're still talking yeah. about it here in the health track tomorrow like it's something new. <laughs> I, I would have expected something more. Where are you on this topic? So I think there's good news and then there's less good news. Let's start with the good news. So 20 years ago, um, I could not have imagined, I literally could not have imagined that it would be possible to test women uh, who had breast cancer and find the one in four who had this signal that we could turn down or turn off with Herceptin. And it turned out that those women had the scariest form of breast cancer. The scariest form of breast cancer we could make into just like any other breast cancer using Herceptin. So the, the degree to which that was groundbreaking is just amazing, amazing in every way. So today, no breast cancer doctor would ever treat a patient without knowing, does she have HER2 overexpression? Yes, no. If people talk about triple negative breast cancer because you look for estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, HER2. So all breast cancer is treated using these precision techniques, just routine now. So in fact, so much has changed about how we treat patients with cancer, especially breast cancer, that I think it truly has been a revolution, and clinical care has now caught up to that. Here's the less good news. Yeah. Three out of four women are not candidates for Herceptin, and it turns out that many of the cancers that we want to treat, two that I would mention that are just awful, brain cancer and pancreatic cancer, are complex. Uh, they aren't driven by one gene that we can just turn off or turn down. So there are particular forms of cancer that are particularly pesky and have not been amenable to the kind of precision care we want. Um, the other thing that I think is just magnificent though and was driven by this sense that your body's own immune system is more powerful than we thought. The, Herceptin is what you would call a naked antibody. So it is an antibody like you and I make it's just like our antibodies, but made at large doses so that we can recapitulate what you would do should your own body be allowed to do that. Yesterday, the Nobel for Medicine or Physiology was awarded for something that drives precision oncology, precision medicine to the next level. And this is just like, this is, if you're a geek, you'll love this. So it turns out your cancer can signal your immune system not to work. So that's a really evil thing. I always think of cancer as like the meanest thing ever. What a mean thing to do, to turn your body's immune system down. It just like makes me mad. So what makes me happy is saying, oh no, you don't. So the two discoveries, CTLA-4 and uh, PD-1, that were celebrated by the Nobel just yesterday were the ability to know that signal 
and turn it off. So it's, it's as if cancer put the brakes on your immune system and the antagonists take the brakes off. Turn your immune system to target your own cancer. That's why Jimmy Carter celebrated his 94th birthday yesterday. It's exactly that. That's magnificent. That is now, can we take that same precision and know for whom it's gonna work and in whom it's gonna be unsafe so it's as precise as possible? We need to, but boy, that is, that is awesome. So we also have another high profile example of someone in this community who's been very public about his uh, recurrence of cancer. Paul Allen announced yesterday that he uh, has, again, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a blood right. cancer that's been treated by immunotherapy. Does he stand a, an even better chance of treating that this time because of advances in the meantime from his prior? Well, I, I don't know anything about Paul Allen's right. treatment, and I'm really sorry to know that his yeah. non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is back. So you were talking about 20 years ago that Herceptin was approved. 21 years ago, Rituxan was approved, and right. Rituxan is a drug for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Before Rituxan was approved, the most common way you treated non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was in practice was a watch and wait. The treatments were so much worse than your ability to help patients with lymphoma that we would just watch patients until they were so sick that we had no choice. Right. So Rituxan was a dramatic improvement in what we can do for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. These newer immune approaches are better yet. And so when I hear someone has non-Hodgkin's lymphoma today, my first thought is my, my bet, and I hope my bet is right, is there's gonna be somebody who says we have something for that. We have a remedy, we have a medicine, we have something that despite a relapse, which you never want to be in a relapse situation, despite that medicine has improved and precision medicine has improved, so we have something for that. Before we end here, I want to get back to the answer to the poll question. How'd you do on the quiz? Let's, let's pull that back up. So, oh, this, this audience is way too smart. Wow, you guys so, are good. So <laughs> they probably knew that it was a trick question. In the last 20 years, the proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty has, that is correct, almost halved. Almost have. The great news is not only has it almost halved, but here's the opportunity. In the 90s, China, amazing. People lifted themselves out of poverty. In the 2000s, India. Up to now, a billion people since 2000 have, have lifted themselves out of poverty. 750 million of those were in China and India. Sub-Saharan Africa has to be next. That third wave of emerging from poverty has to happen in Sub-Saharan Africa or we will not keep these gains. And what are the keys there? Education and health. Absolutely essential. So what the economists would call human capital, the opportunity with youth in Sub-Saharan Africa is magnificent. The demographic dividend, it won't come true unless health and education are real for those young people. Sue Desmond Hellman, CEO of the Gates Foundation, thank you very much for being a Thinky Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks a lot. That was thank, you. thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. That was fantastic. I'd like to invite back to the stage GeekWire Chairman Jonathan Spasato. Go ahead. All right. Thank you very much.